from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I, th I think you're very, very lucky today to have Shannon here. She's written over 20 books, uh, many of them uh, New York Times bestsellers. She's written about three or four books on, for uh, adults. Uh, you might ask her about uh, her small plastic pig pet when she comes up here for question and answers and her family that lives in uh, Salt Lake. So Shannon, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. I'm tweeting this, so I need pictures. Everybody wave. Yay! Oh, on this side, wave. Yay! Oh, what a great, isn't this an awesome festival? I was up in, I was up in the uh, author pavilion, which is like a perk of being an author, is you get to go into the secret room. And there's like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Ken Burns and Salman Rushdie. I'm like, yeah, no big deal. These are my peers. We totally hung out a few tables away from each other, but still the same room. Oh, I went too fast. Oh, you see this cute picture? Who is that? Oh my gosh, am I so adorable? Look at that little face. My mom told me that I was making up stories before I could talk. She said I'd sit in my high chair for hours on end going, your first question is, why were you in your high chair for hours, right? It's the third child. But I kept telling stories. And as I got older, before I could write stories down, I would draw pictures. Did you know that pictures is just another form of storytelling? So before I could write, this is in kindergarten, I told a story about a witch with long green fingernails. And she ate children. But look at her smile. She's fulfilled in her work, and you have to respect that. As I got older, I found other ways to tell stories. I loved doing theater. I would do little plays with my brothers and sisters and act out stories with my friends. And then when I got into fourth grade, there we are. Any children of the 80s in here? Feathered, feathered bangs. I, um, I had a teacher who started us writing poems and short stories, and I suddenly realized that you could do that, that all those books in the library, had someone had written those. And I think I thought that, that all writers were dead or like long extinct like dinosaurs. I didn't know until I started writing that maybe they were alive. When I was little, we didn't get to meet writers. We, we didn't have access to writers. So that was a huge revelation for me. And I decided right then I wanted to be a writer when I grew up. And it took a lot longer than I thought. I was 10 years old when I decided I wanted to be a writer. Any guesses how many more years after that I got my first book published? What do you think? Three? <laughs> it was 19 years. And that's not unusual, but it felt like forever for me. But in that time, I read thousands of books, which is the most important part of becoming a writer, is reading and knowing what's out there and absorbing how stories work. And I'd taken many writing classes. I decided that you needed to do something 100 times before you can do it well. So I wrote 100 stories. I threw them away. And then I thought, I'm finally ready to be a real writer. By the time I was in graduate school, I felt like I'd written some stuff that was finally worth publishing. I started sending my book and some short stories out to see if anyone wanted to publish them which means put them into book form and have them in libraries and, and bookstores where people can get them. I waited to hear back. I got the first response in the mail. I opened up the letter. What do you think it said? No? It said no? All right. But I wasn't going to quit, right? So I sent it out again. I waited to hear back again. I got a second response. I opened it up. What did it say this time? No. You, there's so many people who are like, we know how the world works. There's like a five-year-old like, it says no. Come on. Again and again and again, I got no, no, no. Can I have a helper? Would you help me? No? Right here. Who wants to help? You want to help me? Come here. She's like, I'm not. She's, she's smart. She's like, I'm not committing to anything without a full explanation beforehand. Here, come up on stage. I laminated into a roll some of the rejection letters I got before I ever got an acceptance. Stay back there, OK, sweetheart? Oh, you're adorable. OK, now grab that end. It's kind of slippery. Keep pulling it out, and then when you get to the end, hold it real tight, and we'll hold it up for them. Uh, you are doing a great job. It's actually really hard to do this slippery thing. 
So day, day after day, week after week, year after year, rejection after rejection after rejection, telling me I was not good enough. It's kind of like getting letters every week from New York saying, dear Shannon, you stink, love the editors. And the next one's like, dear Shannon, you still stink, love the editors. Dear Shannon, you stink so bad, we can smell you all the way from New York City, love the editors. And there was just no guarantee it was ever going to stop. You got it? OK, hold it tight. I'm going to just pull it out so that everybody can see. There we go. Thank you, sweetheart. You did such a great job. You can go back down now. But let me just give you a little thank you mask. Can you give her a little hand. Isn't she wonderful? <laughs> Fearless. Eventually, it did stop. The hard thing with rejection is you don't know that it's going to stop. And it takes a, lo a lot of faith and maybe a lot of tears and a lot of pain. And I didn't give up. And sometimes I don't know why I didn't. When everybody's telling you you're not good enough, it's, I wanted to give up. But I couldn't bear the thought of someday looking back and thinking, what if? It's a horrible feeling. So I did keep going. And eventually, somebody said yes. The first thing I ever got published was called The Goose Girl. Everybody, oh, thank you. Well, that's it, I'm out. Thanks, folks. <laughs> um, the Goose Girl was uh, rejected by everybody. And eventually, a small publisher published it as the second book they'd ever published in the US. And it went on to be voted by teens across the US as one of their top 10 favorite books, and it recently was voted as one of the top 100 best books of all time for teens. So all those people who said it wasn't good enough, were they right? Yes, they were. <laughs> Because although, of course, they were wrong to say it wasn't good enough for anybody, it wasn't right for them. And that's what rejection has taught me, is it's not that you're worthless when you're rejected. It's just it's this is not right. This person, this circumstance, this time, this is not right. It's not that you're not right. This circumstance is not right. And we keep going, and eventually we find a home. I published a few more books. Uh, Prin Princess Academy. Thanks, folks. I'm out. I, I need to leave when there's applause. You've got you to end on a high note. Um, and there's some new covers for that. But anyway, uh, Ever After High is a series that I did. It was a lot of fun. Um, in our family, we love superheroes. And I've told a lot of superhero stories. This is my husband and son, Batman and Robin. That's to scale. <laughs> Here's my daughter, Wonder Woman. One thing having kids has showed me is that a kid is not just one thing, right? You're complicated. You've got a lot of sides to you. You could be Wonder Woman. You can be a princess. You can be a fairy. You can be Spider Girl. You can be a pirate. You can be a tiger. You can be a warrior. All wrapped into one. And I, uh, my husband and I wanted to write a story that expressed that, that someone can be more than just one thing. And we came up with the princess in black. So, yay! So Princess in Black, Prince, she's Princess Magnolia by day, and the Princess in Black whenever monsters invade. This came about one day my daughter, who was four at the time, was wearing this butterfly skirt, and she was pointing to different colors on it. And she said, pink is a girl color, and purple's a girl color, and yellow's a girl color, but not black. And I was like, what? Girls could wear black. Why do colors have genders anyway? It doesn't make any sense. Like, did you know 100 years ago, boys wore pink and girls wore blue? It just doesn't make any sense how this happened. But I was like, girls could wear black. I wear black. And she's like, yeah, because you're not really a girl. You're a mama. And I was like, all right. But Batgirl wears black. Aha. I thought I had her. But she said, mama, princesses don't wear black. It's like, whoa. It was one of those moments. I couldn't stop thinking about it all day. When my husband came home from work, I was like, the princess in black. And he's like, yes. And so we started writing it. And I am going to, we've, we've done three books so far. Um, we've got the fourth coming out in November, The Princess of Black. The Princess in Black and the second one has a birthday party. And these are her friends. 12 princesses come to her party. They're all named after flowers, like Princess Bluebell and Princess Apple Blossom. The one on the top left is Princess Sneezewort. And the illustrator, Lei Win Pham, based her on her own young self with awkward self-cut bangs and huge glasses. She's my favorite. Um, the newest one is called The Princess in Black 
and the hungry bunny horde. And I'm going to read you an abbreviated version of the first few chapters. Princess Magnolia and her unicorn frimple pants rode toward the village. Princess Sneezewort had invited them to brunch. In anticipation, frimple pants had skipped breakfast. The cafe was so close, the smell of hot bread rode the breeze. Frimple pants began to prance. And then, Princess Magnolia's glitter stone ring rang, the monster alarm. No time to go back to the castle, Frimple Pants, Princess Magnolia whispered, to the secret cave. His tummy grumbled. Frimple Pants hoped it would be a quick battle. Princess Magnolia and Frimple Pants rode into the secret cave. When they came out the other side, they had become the Princess in Black and her pony. Does anybody know? What's his name? Blackie! Yay! Blackie reared on his hind legs. Look out, monsters! Never get between a hungry pony and an especially good brunch. Duff the goat boy was running toward them. Help, he yelled. There are hundreds of them. It's the worst monster invasion ever. Fly, Blackie, fly, said the princess in black. Blackie did not fly, but he did run very fast. They galloped into the goat pasture. The princess in black backflipped off the saddle. The princess in black raised her fists in battle pose. And then the princess in black grinned. Bunnies, she said. When Duff the Goat Boy caught up, the Princess in Black was not battling beasts. The Princess in Black was making kissy faces. That was not right. The Princess in Black always fought the monsters that threatened his goats. Never had she pet the monsters. Never had she made kissy faces at them. Where are the monsters? asked the Princess in Black. Duff was out of breath from running. He pointed at the ground. Where? asked the Princess in Black. Duff pointed some more. There were a lot of bunnies to point at. But I don't see anything besides these bunnies, she said. The bunnies are the monsters, said Duff. The princess in black laughed. Bunnies aren't monsters. But they came from monster land, said Duff. They hopped out of the hole and they're eating my goat's grass. Oh, Duff, said the princess in black. They're cute little bunnies. What harm could they do? Down in monster land, the bunnies had been bored, bored and hungry. They had enjoyed monster fur, they had snacked on rock chips, they had dined on toenail clippings and lizard scales, and still they were hungry. There was a hole in the ceiling of monster land. An interesting smell trickled down. One brave bunny had poked its head through the hole. Grass, an ocean of green grass. I must taste it, said the bunny. The bunny munched some grass. This is yum, it said. I should tell the others, it told the others. And soon, hundreds of bunnies had hopped up to the goat pasture. Blackie's stomach squeaked with hunger. Those bunnies sure seemed to relish the grass. Blackie wondered if it were especially delicious. Blackie closed his eyes. He imagined the grass would be as delicious as brunch. He opened his mouth wide and bit. He sputtered and coughed. It hadn't tasted like donuts. It hadn't even tasted like grass. Blackie had a mouthful of dirt. The bunnies had devoured the entire patch of grass. And it looked like one was nibbling on the end of his tail. Blackie swished his tail. The bunny did not let go. Blackie pranced about. The bunny did not let go. Blackie sat down on his tail. The bunny let go. The bunny crawled away. Just then, a clawed paw reached out of the hole. The first paw was followed by eight more. A massive, drooling, nine-armed monster emerged. It stood on its many hind legs. It opened its jaws. It said, roar. The bunnies stopped eating. They looked at the monster. Roar, the monster started, but it had seen the bunnies. Its eyes widened. The bunnies' noses wiggled. The nine-armed monster dived back into the hole. The bunnies resumed eating. Did you see, said Duff? That massive drooling nine-armed monster was scared of the bunnies. That's impossible, said the princess in black. Bunnies aren't scary. She pet the bunny on her lap. But instead of one bunny, now there were three. Bum, bum, bum. I'm going to stop there. What is going to happen next? Oh my goodness. What's going to happen with the bunnies? Now, some of you might be interested in writing 
stories about superheroes. Can I have three volunteers come up? Would you like to come up? Yeah, come on up. Oh, both of you can come. How about right over there in the red shirt? Yep, yeah, come on up. Yeah, come on up, sir. Here we go. You know what, I have one more, so why don't you come too, okay? All right, here we go. I'm gonna put on my special Princess and Mac black mask. It's still me, it's still Shannon. I know for a second you were like, wait a minute, who's the mask person? It was me, don't get confused. All right, now when I write a superhero, one thing I like to start with, with like with the Princess in Black, we chose somebody that no one would ever suspect was secretly a superhero. So I want you all, you all can do this in your heads, but up here too, you're gonna tell us your ideas. And uh, if you can't think of one right away, I'll, I can help you. But, because we've gotta be fast. So first of all, I want you to think of someone no one would suspect of secretly being a superhero, like a princess in a fluffy pink dress, or the lunch lady, or your mom, or your pet, or someone real, or someone made up, it could be anything. All right, who are you gonna choose? Fishy. You're fishy. What's your fish's name? Fishy. Fishy. All right. And who Lunch are you going to? Lunch lady. Awesome. And who are you going to choose? The, the, the Cinderella's stepmom. Cinderella's stepmom. Who are you going to choose? Raven Queen. Raven Queen. Okay. These are people no one suspects is secretly a superhero. Now, like the Princess in Black, she's got a she's got a superhero name, right? Her secret identity is Princess Magnolia. But then when, she, when there's trouble, she puts on her superhero outfit and has a new name. What is Fishy's superhero name? Ultimate Fishy. Ultimate Fishy. Oh my gosh, are you dying? So, uh, the lunch lady, right? What's the lunch lady's uh, superhero name? Super lunch lady. Super lunch lady. Now, uh, Cinderella's stepmom, what's her superhero name? Blackie. Blackie. And? Uh, Raven Queen, what's her superhero name? Midnight. Midnight, great. Now think about what your superhero's special skills are. Princess is Black is kind of like a Batman or Zorro. She's got kind of like ninja fighting skills. What is, uh, what is the Flash's superpower? Really fast, right? What is Superman's superpower? Laser eyes. He's, he's got laser eyes and he's strong and he flies. Oh, he's so full of himself, really. Enough already with the powers. Okay, so you guys think what are your, what's your superhero's powers? What is Ultimate Fishy's powers? Ultimate camouflage and laser eyes. Ultimate camouflage and laser eyes. Obviously. Okay, Super Lunch Lady. What are, what's uh, Super Lunch Lady's superpowers? Um, she has lunch-related like, weapons. Lunch-related weapons. Absolutely. <laughs> that is fantastic. Yes. And uh, how about, um, what was it, Blackie? Blackie's um, superpowers. A, a lot, of, she has a lot of knives and really sharp things. A lot of knives and really sharp knives. things. Yeah. Ninja with lots of sharp things. You would stay away from Cinderella's stepmother with lots of knives. All right, and um, Ray, Ray, Midnight. What is Midnight's superpowers? Um, she'd be able to do gymnastics. But like a ninja, and she'd use the powers that yes. she has. So she's got magic powers, and she can also fight like a ninja and do gymnastics. Awesome. So one more thing that you need. Do you know the word nemesis? Nemesis is like somebody's number one enemy. When you think of Batman, who's his nemesis? Who do you think? Uh, Joker. Joker, great. So think of your character's number one enemy. Who is Ultimate Fishy's nemesis? Mm. Batman. Batman? Batman. <laughs> In this world, Batman is a villain, is always trying to stop Ultimate Fishy. <laughs> All right, how about Lunch Lady's, uh, Super Lunch Lady's Ultimate ne Nemesis? <laughs> A gigantic robot school bus. All right, and uh, let's see. It was the Cinderella's stepmom when she's a superhero. Uh, what's, what's her nemesis? Her real daughter. Her real daughters. She's always battling. And then uh, Midnight, what is her, who's her nemesis? Her 
her mom. Her mom. Oh, awesome. Let me give you guys special superhero masks. No one will know who you are, and you can save the day. You can keep it, yeah. Thank you. Give them a hand. You're awesome. You guys can go back down now. Good job. You can go back down the stairs. Good job. Thank you. All right, we've got a few more minutes. So, Do anybody have any questions for me? Is there a special microphone or something that travels around? Oh, right here on both sides are, are microphones if you want to ask me a question. Do you want to hold, go over to the microphone so everybody can hear you? Yeah, right here. Hi. Um, I know that you write a lot of series, like the Princess Academy and the new ones. How do you make the books keep, like your readers will keep reading them, like not plot formulaic, like every other series that have been written? <laughs> You're so sweet. Um, so what, what I personally do is I think of every book as standing on its own. I actually don't plot out whole series. I have vague ideas, but I want any book in any series that if that's the only book you read, it would still be a good read and have a beginning and middle and end. So I think about books as one at a time. I don't know if that's what it is or not, but. Oh, I almost tripped on something. Yes, right here. Why did you name Miri after a flower? Yes, so in Princess Academy, the main character's name is Miri, and I said it was named after a mountain flower, and I totally made that up. There's no Miri flower. Though maybe if there's any budding botanists in here and you discover a flower someday, you could name it Miri, and then it would be for real. <laughs> I just liked the word. Yeah. Hi. As someone who plans to study creative writing and foreign languages in college, I was wondering what inspired you to base the magic system in The Goose Girl on languages. Oh, thank you. So The Goose Girl, my first novel, was based on a Grimm's Brother fairy tale. And it was my favorite fairy tale growing up, um, but partly because it left me asking a lot of questions. In the fairy tale, there's stuff that's just never explained. Fairy tales are so brief and fragmented. And so she had this power over wind, and she had a talking horse. And how these things worked never was explained. So in exploring, uh, when I'm writing a novel, you want the magic system to make sense. I want it to feel plausible and real. So I've explored the idea of language, since the horse could speak. What if everything has a language? What if wind had a language? And if you learned the language of the wind, you could control it. Fire and water and trees and everything else came out of that. So that, that was the kernel. Thank you. Right here. What would your secret power be? What would my secret power be? Well, it wouldn't be so secret if I told you. <laughs> I, I have four kids, so I personally would like, um, like, uh, like Elastigirl, you know, where you can just like reach and like grab and stop a child from falling off a banister and make dinner at the same time, you know. That's what I would do. Is that boring? No, come on, I would fly, right? Who wouldn't fly? Yeah. Are you planning any young adult books? I am. Um, I, I write for every age group, from Princess in Black up through adult. And in February, the next book I have coming out is called Squirrel Girl. It's based on the Marvel superhero Squirrel Girl. Yes, got some comic nerds. She's fabulous. She has the proportional strength and agility of a squirrel. She speaks squirrel language. And she's unbeatable. She has beat every big uh, Marvel villain including um, Galactus and Thanos and Doctor Doom, and she's hysterical. It's so funny. I can't wait for it. Since we have a sign language interpreter, uh, I too want to add that one of the main characters in the story is deaf, and we have a really a, a wonderful beta reader for Squirrel Girl who is deaf, developed a Squirrel Girl name sign for us. Can I teach it to you? So I'll teach it to everybody. Take your non-dominant hand and make the S with it, Take your dominant hand, so if you're right-handed, for example, and make the G. And then coming off the S, you do the swoop of a swirl tail with the G. And that's Squirrel Girl. Isn't that awesome? I love that. All right, right over here. When is the new Princess in Black book coming out? Thank you. Um, it is coming out in November, number four. Princess in Black takes a vacation. And I bet you can guess that the vacation doesn't go quite as planned. Yes? Um, how did you think of the characters in your books? Um, just in all of them, or do you have a specific book you're thinking about? Hmm. More like Ever After High. OK. So Ever After High actually was unusual, because Mattel had created this line of toys. 
and they were going to make shows. And they came to me before it was released. It was so secret. I had to sign non-disclosure agreements. We had to use code names. It was crazy. They flew me out to Mattel headquarters in California. It was this big building with no windows. We went down like secret passageways that had all of these like codes to get in. And when I saw the dolls, they were underneath a shroud, and I could only like peek under them. It was, it was like I felt like a spy. Anyway, so they actually created those characters, and then I came in and wrote the first book. And we had such a great time. I ended up writing four books for that. But th in that case, I didn't actually. I helped. I helped flesh out the characters, probably. But they had the initial names and ideas. Right over here. How many superheroes have you made? How many superheroes have I made? I personally consider every book I've written as being a superhero story. That's kind of my secret. They all feel like superheroes to me. But I would, I guess, Princess in Black, Squirrel Girl, I'm going to write a Captain Marvel novel. Those would be my true superheroes. I wrote a, a young adult book called Dangerous, which was my superhero science fiction novel. So I don't know, a few dozen. I'm really good at math. Yes, right here. Why do you name all of the princesses after flowers? Oh, so Princess Magnolia is named after a flower because she is named after my daughter, whose name is Magnolia. And then when we had 12 more princesses, we thought it would be fun to continue that theme. And I just love flower names. Yes. Uh, what is Princess Academy about? Princess Academy is about a village at the top of a mountain. And the way they make a living is they quarry stone. They cut blocks of stone out of the mountain. They're very poor. And one day, a messenger from the king comes up and says their village has been chosen as the place where the next princess will come from. And all of the girls have never been to school before. And they're all sent to a school called the Princess Academy to learn what they need to know in case they are chosen. And they are reluctant about this. They, they don't trust the lowlanders. They don't be really believe one of them has become a princess. But in the process of learning stuff at the school, it changes their life. Yes, right here. How did it make you feel when you wrote the book? When I wrote, when I wrote a book? Yeah, when you wrote Princess in Black. When I wrote Princess in Black, it made me feel like this. Yes! I love it. The re one reason why I keep writing, even though it's really hard for me and I make a lot of mistakes, is there's no feeling in the world like finishing a draft or finishing the whole book and feeling great about it. It's the best feeling. Yes? Um, hi. Um, what is some advice you have for young writers or writers that want to continue writing in the future? Thank you. Uh, my advice would be read everything. Uh, for people, who, for everybody, I would say read what you love. For writers, I say read everything. You need to know not just the kind of books that you write, but everything that's out there. Write for fun. Just write for fun. Don't worry about publishing right now. Don't worry about all that side of it. Enjoy the writing time. Just like it takes years for uh, athletes to become professional or a musician, um, it's the same as developing writing skills. So just enjoy it. Here, right here. Why did you put it on the false book that Duff would be helping the princess in the black, but it never has been? Oh, yes. So Duff the goat boy, we suggest in the first book that he might help out the princess in black and become his own superhero. And it's taken a while, hasn't it? But I might say book four might answer your question. It comes out in November. Get right here. How did you get the idea for Rapunzel's Revenge? Rapunzel's Revenge came, my, my husband, I think this is actually our last question, I'm so sorry, but if you find me right afterwards, I would be happy to answer your question, and then I'm gonna be signing from three to four down there. But so Rapunzel's Revenge was a graphic novel, like a comic book that my husband and I wrote. Um, he was a lifelong comics reader, and I didn't, was not introduced into comics until I married him. And we thought, how can we bring our two uh, loves together? My first love was fairy tales, and his first love was superhero comics. So we were like, what fairy tale character could we turn into a comic book superhero? And we decided Rapunzel, because she's got that long hair. And she, when she's locked up in her tower, she starts to practice with those braids and use them as whip and lasso. And so we set it in the Old West, and she escapes from the tower and becomes a hero. So that's how we came up with that idea. Are you going to make a book two of Rapunzel's Revenge? We did make a book two. Today's your lucky day, sir. came out in 2009. It's called Calamity Jack, and it's based on her friend who was Jack from Jack and the Beanstalk. I, I can't believe how fast 30 minutes went. You, you guys are awesome. Thanks so much for my helpers. Thanks for the great questions. 
This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.